Juanetta, and uh, this morning we've got a very interesting topic in Arctic policy in Alaska, uh, and it's uh, about Arctic fisheries. And uh, we've got three great speakers, and uh, I'm just going to say that, uh, that historically what's, uh, what's happened here is, of course, not much fishing has happened in the Arctic, uh, and we're seeing moving fish stocks north, we're seeing uh, more open water. We're seeing interest of other nations in establishing kind of history uh, uh, in the high seas. And there've been moves both by the international community and by the United States itself to put a moratorium on fishing in the Arctic Ocean until we get more science. And then there's a tug of war over the science where whether or not we have that, uh, the time and the money to do Arctic science to follow this when we've got uh, uh, quotas to set and, and everything else. Where there's a where there's a large volume fishery, my friend Dave Benton has warned us about that. So uh, today we're going to have uh, three speakers. Uh, uh, Steve McLean is uh, with the uh, is the Arctic Fishery Management Plan Coordinator at the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, which, as you know, is the giant council created by Congress in 1976 to manage the North Pacific and Bering Sea and Arctic fisheries. Uh, Stephanie Madsen is executive director of the ATSI Processors Association and is a former chair of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And Simon Kinneen uh, is the current chair of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council and is also uh, a, 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 on the uh, staff of the uh, North, uh, Norton Sound Economic Development uh, uh, Corporation, which is the CDQ group, northernmost CDQ group in the nation. Uh, community Development Quota Group, which uh, works on fisheries, and uh, Simon is in from Nome this morning. Stephanie, I think you're in Juneau, and Steve, I think you're in Anchorage. With that, uh, let me uh, just uh, hand it on, I think, first to Steve to give us the background, and we'll go from there. All right, uh, me. thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm Steve McLean. I'm with the council staff. Um, and responsible for managing the Arctic Fishery Management Plan. Um, I did go back and look through and note that uh, you guys have received a presentation from Edwin Bolton, who talked about some of the international issues and policies, and uh, also gave away my punchline um, that we currently have a moratorium on fisheries in the Arctic. So, hopefully, today I will be able to introduce and present some information about why, and then potentially um, what might happen next in the future. Um, I'm looking to see if I do have control. I don't have control, so that's great, Aaron, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Commonwealth North and the Arctic Policy Study Group for this opportunity. Um, and I'm going to welcome uh, the discussion. I've got two, uh, the current chair and the former chair of the council for which I work, so I'd better uh, make sure that I get all of this right. Um, next slide, please. So I'll give a little bit of an introduction to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council for those of you who might not be aware. Um, the North Pacific Council establishes the fishery policy um, for the Gulf of Alaska, the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands, and the Arctic area. Um, the council jurisdiction is those federal waters, so from three to 200 miles um, in those regions. The objective um, from these councils is to develop policy um, that is then put into regulation and implemented by the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, there are a number of advisory bodies that provide information to the council and numerous committees, but also the advisory panel and the scientific and statistical committee that meet concurrently with the council at every meeting and do provide recommendations on most agenda items. So this is structured um, specifically to involve stakeholders in fishery management and provide that advice and that information to the council as they make their decisions. There are 11 voting members on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, Alaska has six voting members. Washington has three. Oregon has one. And then the National Marine Fishery Service also has uh, a voting seat at the table. There are also four non-voting members that are advisory to the council. Um, next slide, please. The 
fisheries in Alaska, in the Gulf of Alaska, the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands, um, and the Arctic are uh, managed through fishery management plans. Um, these provide policy guidance for fishery management and also to inform the public um, of the expectations for federal management in those areas. We have a number of existing FMPs. I'll refer to the fishery management plans as FMPs. Um, the Gulf of Alaska groundfish, the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands groundfish, Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands king and tanner crab, Alaska scallop, salmon, and what we're talking about today, the Arctic fishery management plans. Um, they all contain conservation and management measures um, that scientific advice has told us is necessary to prevent overfishing and to promote the long-term health and importantly, the sustainability of those fishery resources. There are a number of regulations um, that kind of serve as the toolbox for uh, managing those fisheries. Um, and those are, are listed below. But importantly also, um, the FMPs have to contain a description of the fishery of which species and all of the managed species or targeted fisheries must be identified in an FMP. Um, we is, uh, the FMPs must describe the maximum sustainable yield and the optimum yield. And those are identified by uh, another advisory body, the plan teams, um, which are species experts and scientific experts in the agencies and provide that information, identify uh, the health of the stocks and identify that information for the council. Uh, they also identify essential fish habitat, the impacts on participants and communities, um, bycatch reporting methods, um, and, and other information and measures that are necessary to manage. Next slide, please. So the Arctic Fishery Management Plan covers the Arctic management area. Those are the waters north of the Bering Strait and includes the exclusive economic zone from three to 200 miles of the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea. And I do note that this is different from the definition of the Arctic that includes the Bering Sea and the Aleutian Islands. Um, those fisheries are covered in other FMPs. Um, so I'm not gonna be discussing those waters today. The Arctic Fishery Management Plan was developed uh, in the uh, 2000 aughts, I guess, um, and approved and implemented in 2009. Next slide, please. The FMP for the Arctic does contain a management policy. And what you see here is simply the first sentence of that management policy. Um, but importantly, it does talk about responsible fisheries management based on sound scientific research and analysis to ensure the sustainability of fisheries resources and to protect associated ecosystems for the benefit of current users and future generations. And so it was a forward-looking FMP. Um, there are a number of objectives that are outlined on the right-hand side of the slide. I'm not going to get into all of those, but those are all addressed in the FMP. Next slide, please. In the Arctic, the conservation and management measures that are identified, um, importantly, uh, are committing to using the best scientific information um, to, to provide an assessment and in the protection of those biological resources in the management area. Um, like other FMPs, the Arctic FMP does um, establish these fisheries management criteria, maximum sustainable yield, optimum yield, the methods for fishing and, and protection, overfishing limits, et cetera. Um, and importantly, um, when you get down to, for all FMPs, when you get down to how those fish are um, actually fished, we have what's called an acceptable biological catch, which is the number of, of fish that are, uh, could be taken from the system. And then uh, total allowable catch as it is then um, allocated to the different uh, fisheries sectors and gear types, et cetera, in uh, those active fisheries. There are also um, restrictions that are identified in the Arctic FMP um, gear, uh, time and area. <clears throat> um, also identify the monitoring and management and enforcement necessary um, for managing fisheries in the Arctic. Um, so importantly, we do rely on assessments and those are based on data that come from surveys. So one of the most important things that, that we can stress is the importance of surveys, scientific surveys in the areas where fisheries occur and in the areas where fisheries might occur. 
and then that's what we're talking about in the Arctic. Um, so when the Arctic FMP was developed in 2009, they used the best scientific information available at the time. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about next. If we go on to the next slide, please. We look at the biological resources that were identified in the Arctic. And here we see the biomass estimates in the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea for the five most common fish species and also snow crab, which was the most uh, important or uh, invertebrate of the most interest in the Arctic area. And you look at those biomass estimates and you can see that there is much more um, generally available in the Chukchi Sea than in the Beaufort Sea. Um, and these, uh, like I said, are the five most common um, fish species and snow crab. And snow crab was probably of most interest at the time because of the biomass um, that appeared to be present in both the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea. However, most of the snow crab that were seen in those surveys were small. Um, the exploitable biomass would be the crabs that are most interested to the fishery, um, are those with the carapace width greater than 100 millimeters. And the total biomass for those crabs was right around 6,500 tons in the Chukchi Sea. Now you can compare that to the exploitable biomass that was available in the Eastern Bering Sea at the time was about 138,000 tons, and now is about 276,000 tons. So you can see that there's far fewer um, crab available in the Arctic area than in the Eastern Bering Sea. So that is just the first step in um, the management of those fisheries in the Arctic. Next slide, please. So that information um, and those assessments were taken to identify the maximum sustainable yield, the total amount of uh, the resource that could be removed from the system sustainably. For Arctic cod, that was about 5,758 tons, saffron cod, 589 tons, and snow crab, about 453 tons. The, all of the FMPs do allow for a change um, in optimum yield from the maximum sustainable yields. The optimum yield is, is the target. And we do allow those reductions due to socioeconomic and ecological factors. If there's something that is not considered in a strict biological assessment, it can be factored in to address optimum yield. The reductions in optimum yield come from those ecological and socioeconomic factors. If we're talking about socioeconomic factors in the Arctic, they consider the uncertainty of the estimates. And in the FMP, it's identified that the reductions from uncertainty was about 35% from maximum sustainable yield as a, as a conservation and a way to address the uncertainty. But then also the costs is one of the factors, socioeconomic factors that was considered. And the fact that there is no infrastructure there in the Arctic ready to take uh, a fishery, the, uh, reduction in optimum yield from that um, was 100% reduction. Also ecological considerations and the protection of marine systems allowed for a reduction in optimum yield. So the result of that is that for Arctic cod, saffron cod, and snow crab, the only three species for which um, MSY and OY were developed, that reduction is 100%. And that does result then in the no commercial fishing for any FMP managed fishery is authorized in the Arctic management area. And that is commonly known as the moratorium. And the Arctic FMP does state that no commercial fishing would be authorized until scientific information is available to understand the impacts and to ensure the sustainability of that fishery. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that was in 2009. And of course, many things have changed. Um, the Arctic is warming as, uh, has been discussed before, there is more open water. There is the potential for fish species to be moving. Um, so next slide, please. We look at what might happen. So we're looking at potential future fishing in the Arctic. One of the main species of interest right now is in Pacific cod. Um, as we said, as North Pacific waters are warming, uh, some species may begin to move forward. Uh, in 2010 survey, uh, survey 
estimated that the entire northern population of Pacific cod, that is in those areas um, north of St. Lawrence Island, um, generally, um, amounted to about 3% of the Southeast Bering Sea stock. Next slide, please. A survey in 2017 indicated a 900% increase in that Northern Bering Sea. In other words, um, many more fish were seen in the Northern Bering Sea than had been seen in 2010. Next slide, please. And then in 2018, the survey indicated that there were more Pacific cod in the northern part of the Bering Sea than in the southeastern Bering Sea. And so as these fish appear to be moving northwards, we get into the uh, international boundary, we get into the uh, northern boundary of those surveys. And the question remains, um, do, are those fish actually moving into the, into the Chukchi Sea? Um, interestingly, genetic studies of the Pacific cod in the Northern Bering Sea indicated that those are the same Pacific cod as are seen in the Southeast Bering Sea population. So it's not a new population, it is a change in distribution. So the question became, why are they changing that distribution? Um, and it is clear, I think, that it's the effects of, of climate warming on the Bering Sea cold pool. Um, as ice forms um, in the Bering Sea creates cold water, um, that in years of heavy ice or uh, thick ice um, extends down into the southeastern Bering Sea. Pacific cod um, avoid that cold pool, and when that cold pool is of great extent, they are found primarily in the southeastern Bering Sea. As that cold pool shrinks, the Pacific cod do move northward. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So the question, like I said, does remain about whether or not those fish are moving into the Chukchi Sea and whether or not they could support commercial fisheries. <clears throat> in order for that to happen, um, we would require scientific surveys in the, re in the region to assess the population of fish that are there. Um, if those populations do appear to be in the Chukchi Sea and appear to be sufficient to maintain and sustain commercial fisheries, the same management criteria would need to be established, that is maximum sustainable yield, OY, the allowable biological catch, and the total allowable catch um, would be recommended by the council's advisory bodies. Um, if then the council determined that they wish to open the southern part of the Chukchi Sea to fisheries, it would require amendment of that FNP um, in order to authorize commercial fishing. And initiating an amendment process initiates that public process through NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, um, which would uh, allow for public comment and uh, an analysis of options that would be presented to uh, open any other fishery management area um, to commercial fishing. So that is a brief overview. Next slide, please. Um, I'd again like to thank the uh, uh, organizers for the opportunity to provide uh, this information. I look forward to questions at the end of the presentations. Here's my contact information, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions now. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I'll respond as, as quickly as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, now uh, let's turn to Stephanie. Well, good morning, everyone. And again, thank you to Commonwealth North um, for uh, inviting me. I have participated and I've enjoyed our early morning Arctic uh, policy study groups. Uh, so thank you for um, taking the interest in it. Um, this morning, my discussion is going to be a little bit about what happened this summer and what the implications might be for future uh, future events uh, in the Arctic. Um, again, my name is Stephanie Matson. I'm the executive director of the ASSI Processing uh, Processors Association. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. 
just a quick reminder about who we are. Uh, we are the larger vessels. Uh, as you can see here, we are catcher processors. So uh, as many of you online know, that's we catch the fish and process it. We are large. Um, the vessels that you see here are uh, the one on the upper, the blue one is owned by Coastal Villages. Uh, Simon's group has some ownership in uh, the vessel on the left on the screen. And then the bottom one is American Seafoods. Our uh, cooperative is called the Pollock Conservation Cooperative. And I know that it kind of gets confusing. As sea processors, Pollock Conservation Cooperative, but it's all one and the same. Uh, next slide. And this is what we do. Um, I'm sure, uh, I hope, everybody online has tasted wild Alaska Pollock. It is a cousin to cod. It's the largest fishery in the US and it's the largest certified sustainable fishery in the world. Um, and as you can see, we're both certified by the Marine Stewardship Council, as well as the Alaska Responsible Fisheries Management. Uh, we are a federal fishery. We have two federal observers on board uh, and we have lots of scales and cameras. So we're well uh, regulated. Next slide, please. So I think the next slide, when Aaron gets a chance to go there, uh, I don't need to remind anybody on here about uh, this picture. Um, I think some people don't recognize that the legal definition of the Arctic includes the Bering Sea. Um, so as you can see on this picture, you can kind of orientate yourself uh, to kind of remember where we are on the next couple of slides. But you see the uh, Russian US maritime boundary line there and how close it gets to US uh, further north. Um, the colors here I think are important because the darker blue is deeper water. You can see the shelf break there where most of the fishing takes place and then you see uh, the shelf. Uh, next slide please Aaron. I'm going to keep this one up for a little while because this is really what we're going to be talking about today and you know for uh, most of you on here I see a lot of my colleagues. Um, you know that I've spent basically my entire career uh, living and working in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. I lived out in Unalaska Dutch Harbor for 19 years and kind of grew up in my career uh, watching the, the Bering Sea fisheries change from a foreign fishery fleet to a joint venture to a fully domesticated uh, fleet. And uh, as a resident of out there, I, I can testify that the Arctic is truly remarkable. It's rich native culture, stunning productive marine ecosystem, and the vital geopolitical positioning makes it um, a hot topic. So for decades, um, our fleet has been able to operate safely and obviously legally, um, relying on the US USSR maritime boundary. But that feeling of safety and security changed the last week of August. My, our fishing fleets, as you can see here, um, you can see the US EEZ, and the vessel names are there for the interactions that I'm gonna talk about. You can also see that, you know, we've got military fighter planes and frigates, uh, as well as a, a nuclear submarine that happened to be in the area. Um, so these events were alarming and caused genuine fear uh, for the safety of our fishing captains and their crews, and actually disrupted a very productive uh, fishing uh, business operations. Um, and it does raise a question, I think, that um, we need to uh, keep in the back of our mind. And that is, do we risk these kinds of confrontations becoming something of a new normal in the changing article, Arctic? And if so, what are the US policymakers and military planners doing to safeguard US economic and security interests in this vital region? Um, I provided some testimony to a Senate hearing that actually got uh, canceled and hasn't been rescheduled, uh, but that testimony is available and it really does go into a lot more details about the events than I'm able to cover this morning. Um, but we, uh, we thought something was up when the nuclear sub uh, surfaced about two and a half miles from one of our vessels, made no contact. And then the next day, uh, that's when things really started to pop. So I want you to imagine that you're in the middle of the Bering Sea, almost 200 miles from shore, conducting legal fishing operations 
when a military, <clears throat> excuse me, warplane buzzes your vessel and initiates radio contact and through broken English started to deliver an alarming drumbeat of a message warning of danger and insisting that you leave as it continues to fly over your vessel at an increasingly low altitude. That is exactly what happened to Captain Tim Thomas on the Northern Jaeger. Then a Russian warship appeared and issued an order that instructed him to sail due south for five hours and not return until September 4th. And this is what it sounded like for Captain Thomas. So it was quite alarming, and Captain Thomas actually had a Russian speaker on board uh, and still had difficulty um, understanding why and what they were requesting. But as you can see, our vessel wasn't the only one that was impacted. We had two Fraser Longliners up there. One of them had to cut their gear. Uh, the Russians were pretty adamant that you, uh, they were in danger. There was live missile fire. And so they cut their gear and left the area. Uh, another uh, fleet that were catcher catchers that delivered to mother ships had their gear in the water. And they had a Russian frigate steaming toward them, telling them to evacuate the area. And they were trying to explain that they had gear in the water and they weren't able to maneuver. So I hope that that, uh, you know, provides you a feeling of what the captains were facing. Uh, we were kind of all alone out there. There was no US, U.S. Coast Guard presence. We didn't know about it. You can see here on the map that there's uh, two areas called Hydro Pack. Uh, apparently that is the legal notification that the Russians have to give the U.S. government, which was done, but the fishing fleet never knew. So it seems to me as a proud US citizen that that is totally unacceptable. Uh, we have had uh, uh, briefings from both the State Department and the US Coast Guard um, about that. Um, and I think that we're gonna see some changes. Um, I can't remember, you can kind of orient yourself about where we were. We were close to the border. We're fully legal. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, Aaron. So push come to shove, these are the three things that we're asking uh, folks to, uh, the US government to uh, address. First of all, it is imperative that we hear directly from our government, not a foreign government. It's imperative that other parts of the US government, most importantly, the Coast Guard needs to be alerted and have an opportunity to plan for the safety of US mariners including US flag vessels uh, while they operate legally in the US EEZ. And finally, in the event of a military exercise, we believe strongly that US Coast Guard assets need to be on the ground uh, to make sure that there are no engagements or interactions that are inappropriate. I think the other thing I just wanted to highlight this morning is that um, we're large vessels. We have technology, we have communications. But if you reflect back on the map and you look further north, there are gonna be some subsistence fishermen, maybe some small boat commercial fishermen that could be in the same situation in the future. So we need to not only address the technology about communicating with sophisticated US fishing fleets, but I think further north, those communities should be communicating and aware and informed of any exercise that happens. So uh, Aaron, next slide. I think I just wanted to wrap up a little bit with a, a picture of the Bering Sea. And I know there's a lot here, but <clears throat> as you can see, um, you can see where the Russian military zone was. That was about the size of Washington state. That was a very large area. The hot spots are where we've been fishing, our footprint. And then I wanted to just highlight some other closure areas that exist in the Bering Sea, because I think people have an impression that the Bering Sea is very large, which it is. 
but fish aren't everywhere. And as you look at spatial closures, um, the Bering Sea gets quite small. Uh, next slide. And there we go. I'd like to thank again Commonwealth North. Sorry about my voice. It was fine earlier. And I'll be, I'll look forward to uh, answering any questions. Stephanie, thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Simon, you're up next and uh, it's about 8.35. So after your presentation, we will have uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. And uh, Simon, uh, thanks for joining us. All right. Uh, thank you, Mead, and thanks everybody for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's uh, great to hear the, the presentations from both Steve and, and Stephanie. Well done and, and informative. And to the, to the extent that I'm involved with those, um, those uh, uh, things that you've covered, I, I thought you did a, a, a great job. So just um, again, my name is Simon Kinnean. I'm the Vice President and Quota and Acquisitions Manager for uh, the Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation. I've been here for about uh, just a little over 20 years now, um, time flies. And uh, and again, as, as was mentioned, I, I'm also the, the chairman of the North Pacific Council and have the, uh, the great pleasure of working with Steve and other members of the, the North Pacific Council staff. You can, can ask for a, a better group of, of people to work with over there. So with that, let me share my screen here. said am i sharing the right screen okay yeah. all right great okay um so again uh i'm going to be uh talking from the perspective of the uh western alaska community development quota program and and again i'm i'm uh i work for the northern sound economic development corporation so i'm going to be kind of more focused there since that's what i'm, I'm most familiar with but happy to take questions on anything uh, regarding the cdq program at the end And trying to figure out, okay. So uh, the, the Community Development Quota Program uh, was, was created in, um, in 1992 by the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. And it was originally um, uh, had a, a three-year sunset put in uh, uh, that the, the program would, would uh, expire at the end of, but uh, it was later made permanent through federal legislation. Um, so, the original criteria for uh, community eligibility in the program was that you had to be that the community had to be located within 50 miles of the of the the Bering Sea. Um, so, using that uh, criteria, six basic uh, or six groups were formed using a generally regional uh, perspective. You see to the to the south end here, if you can see my pointer, the Aleutian Pribilof Island Community Development Group. Uh, in the Aleutians along with uh, St. George, uh, the Bristol Bay Economic Development uh, Corporation here in the Bristol Bay area. S uh, Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association represents St. Paul. In the Kuskokwim area, you've got um, uh, the Coastal Villages Region Fund. Um, the Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association is here in the, the low, lower Yukon area. And then the the group, again, that I work for is the, the Norton Sound CDQ group, Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation, which is at the further uh, northernmost extent of the, uh, of the, the Bering Sea uh, with communities and uh, Diomede and Wales being at the, at the northern end. So just a, a bit about why the, the program was, was formed. Um, so, uh, there was some discussion, Stephanie talked a little bit about the, the history there. Originally it was uh, the, the fisheries were, were foreign owned and, and operated and, and slowly transitioned to an Americanized fishery through, through changes in, in laws. And as that Americanization took place, um, the, the communities in the, in the Bering Sea were not necessarily in a, in a position to take advantage of that Americanization. So even though those large Bering Sea fisheries uh, were occurring and becoming Americanized, um, the, the, the residents of Western Alaska were not uh, participating in, in most of the, those fisheries and, and receiving the, the benefits of them. 
So the, the North Pacific Council, again, in 92, created the, the program and, and took a, a percentage of the annual fishing rights in the, in the Bering Sea and assigned them to the, uh, the six CDQ groups. Um, initially, it was, a, uh, it was just with, with Pollock, but, after, uh, but over, over time, that, that basically became allocations of, of most of those federal fisheries. So including uh, sable fish and halibut and, and crab and, and Pacific cod and, and flatfish and, and other fisheries there. So what typically happens now is that the, the CDQ groups will take those allocations of, of fish and um, enter into uh, harvest agreements with, with the existing uh, fishing fleet and uh, in exchange for the, the harvest right be paid a, a royalty. Uh, which allows the, the CDQ groups to take those dollars and, and do good things in, in the communities. So the, the stated purpose of the, of the CDQ program in, in, in what's the, the current federal legislation is to provide Western Alaska villages with the opportunity to participate and invest in fisheries in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. And we do that through um, uh, supporting economic development in the in the communities, alleviating poverty, providing economic and, and social benefits. And originally, the, the program was very much oriented just around uh, uh, fisheries uh, fisheries related activities, but has since expanded, and I'll touch on that in a, in a little bit. But but in addition to just allowing it to providing um, uh, benefits in our member communities, it's also allowed us to invest in further into uh, Bering Sea and Aleutian Island fisheries to uh, uh, further fund our program and expand our, our scope in the, in the Bering Sea. So again, um, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on, on the Norton Sound community since that's what I'm, I'm most familiar with here. Again, this is the, the northernmost extent of the, of the CDQ program. You've got our, our 15 uh, communities here. And, and really our, our focus and the focus of, of the groups since inception has been on um, fisheries related development in, in our member communities. It's the cornerstone of the, the program and the, and the primary focus of what we do. And so I, I think it's, it's no secret that fishery business is, is prevalent in, in Alaska and it's, and it's a valuable uh, um, uh, business for Alaskans to be in. Um, in Western Alaska and even, even more so in, in, uh, up in the Northern region where we are, um, there are significant economic hurdles to, to doing uh, business here. So for, for instance, in, in the Norton Sound region, we don't have any, any freezer barges, any ability to ship out fish by sea, everything has to go uh, by air. So you can imagine the economics of, of a, a pink salmon, which is, is not that valuable of a fish. If we're gonna do something with it, we have to, to ship it out by air. So one of the things that, that being a, a participant in the CDQ program does is allow us to equalize the high cost of, of doing business in, in Western Alaska. So I'll just touch a little bit on the, on the various fisheries that we participate in up here in the Norton Sound region. So the, the first one is our, our Norton Sound Red King Crab fishery, which unfortunately is, is currently experiencing a, a, a closure due to uh, 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 low populations, although there's great signs for it in the in the in the future with the uh, with strong recruitment coming in in the next few years. Um, it's uh, a, a, a two prong fishery. We have both a summer fishery, uh, which is the the larger of the of the two, that's prosecuted by a, a fleet of of small boat um, fishermen. We also have a, a fairly unique fishery um, of uh, winter. Red king crab, which uh, has to be taken through the ice during the, the winter months, and um, where where uh, local fishermen head out by snow machine, set pots through the ice, and and take the the, the fishery that way. Again, fairly or almost entirely unique, perhaps. Um, uh, we've got a. a Probably our, our largest fishery in, in terms of the, the number of fishermen is our, our salmon fishery. And we have a, 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 a buying or processing plants in, in Yonkleet and in Nome, along with uh, buying stations throughout a number of our communities. This is, um, again, something that, that's an extremely valuable fishery for our, our fishermen and, and well supported by 
um, by uh, our CDQ dollars. Our halibut fishery is another very important fishery for, for fishermen, and this occurs in, in a couple of locations, both out of Nome and out of Savunga, which is on St. Lawrence Island. St. Lawrence Island fishery is, is a pretty interesting one. Those are, those are tough fishermen out there. Uh, the, the boat on the, the top is, is the typical vessel uh, in Savunga, an 18-foot boat with a, a small outboard where fishermen go out and haul all their gear by, by hand. It's, it's, those, are, those are tough fishermen out, out there and they, and they work hard for their, for their dollars and um, you know, occasionally pull up the 300 plus pound fish, which you can imagine is some, quite, quite the feat uh, when doing by hand. Um, not the most valuable fishery, but certainly a, a very cost-effective fishery to enter is our bait fishery, where uh, fishermen will go out and, and uh, harvest bait fish through the ice and uh, provide bait for our, our local fishermen. So very, very simple and easy to get into fishery. And then uh, kind of reflecting on, on um, Steve's earlier comments regarding the um, the northward migration of, of fish. We've really seen an increase in the in the uh, uh, Pacific cod abundance here in the the Norton Sound region, and this is this is something that our fishermen are starting to take an advantage of. Um, it's helped along by the the fact that the uh, the North Pacific Council the last few years uh, changed the rules, which uh, uh, I guess helped us um, get get fishermen fishing. Um, uh, when when they couldn't before by relaxing some of the LLP requirements, the license limitation requirements for local fishermen. So uh, that's a, an example of the council being responsive to the, the northward movement of fish. So while the the fishermen themselves are, are, are kind of the, the the typical shining star of uh, of fisheries in the in the the Norton Sound. It, it's really important to note that, that the local fisheries also produce quite a bit of uh, jobs and, and support areas. You know, we, we have, a, I think the typical seasonal position is, or to, we typically hire about 230 uh, seasonal uh, workers to help support our, our fisheries. And at um, just under $12.50 an hour, I think we have the, the highest, um, Entry level processing uh, wage for um, anywhere in Alaska. And again, that couldn't happen without the, the CDQ program. Uh, so we have three, three uh, processing facilities, buying stations located throughout the, the region, a number of tender vessels. Um, and again, it's all important income for, for our residents. And, and um, we've got the ability to hire everybody for these positions come from our region, which is a, a, a great help. And actually, I think was one of the, the reasons we were able to be successful in not having any, any uh, shutdowns this season due to COVID, which is something we strove quite uh, strongly to, to do. So just a, a little bit more about how we help our fishermen get on the, the water. So uh, we provide uh, very low interest or no interest loans for, for uh, basically whatever fishermen need to get to, to fishing. So vessels, motors, gears, permits, uh, we, we do our best to support fishermen to um, do what they love to do. So just a, a little bit, so it's, it's not just um, commercial fishery work that we do in the region. I'll cover a little bit about this uh, next. Um, in, in our fisheries research and, and development program, um, we focus on making significant investments into the research and management end of fisheries. You know, and that's in recognition of the better our local data is, the better fisheries can be managed. So. We operate our program in the region on a, on a scale that's roughly equivalent to the, the size of the programs that the Department of Fish and Game runs here. So we, we basically match what, what they do. We employ five or six biologists, have a number of, of uh, support staff and run field projects throughout the summer that employs, uh, again, a large number of our residents. 
and um, focus also focus on marine debris, debris cleanup efforts that help keep our, our communities and shorelines clean. So just a few of our programs, we do salmon rehabilitation and restoration uh, uh, projects, maybe what you could consider a mini hatchery program to target certain stocks as well as provide fertilization efforts to boost our, our red salmon fishery. So another major focus of, of CDQ groups is, is partner employment, you know, working on, on the, the vessels such as uh, what Stephanie talked about before, it's not the sort of thing that's that's for everybody, but they are uh, great paying jobs. And when we have residents that do wish to uh, to go out and work on those on those vessels, we uh, we have partnerships with our our harvesting partners to to make sure that um, that they have those uh, those jobs available to them. Um, training and scholarships is another large focus for the CDQ program. And so, from uh, just from NSCDC's perspective, we started. You know, in the in the inception of our program, with about thirty thousand dollars in scholarships on an annual basis, and that's grown to almost one point five million dollars on an annual basis for residents of our region. So, again, between our our fifteen communities, that's a that's a, a meaning meaningful amount of uh, of uh, education that that our our board has has uh, decided to to fund. Got a number of community benefits programs that we we support as as well, um, working with uh, with local partners, the um, uh, municipal governments, tribes, local organizations. Uh, we work with the hospital to uh, train nurses locally, so they don't have to go to Anchorage or, or beyond. We we train them in region. Um, got a, the uh, a rescue vessel there that we've we've helped to fund and. Um, uh, we've also helped to uh, provide other infrastructure uh, throughout the region as well. We work with um, with the, the communities on large utilities programs, such as our community energy fund, providing a million dollars to each member community for efficiency upgrades. Water and sewer fund was just created uh, not too long ago, a million dollars to each community for uh, infrastructure needs in that area and a consolidated bulk fuel program that we operate on an annual basis where we uh, allow uh, uh, eligible participants to, uh, to combine fuel orders that we, we administer and, uh, and, and provide no interest loans for, uh, for communities to participate in and lowering the fuel costs for, for all participants. We've got a small business grant program that has been really popular in the, in the communities and, and to support various large infrastructure improvements throughout the region, you know, things such as community centers and, uh, and docks and, and boat ramps. Another large focus for the, the CDQ program is, is investing into the, the Bering Sea. So it's not just the allocations of fish that we, we um, were received as, as part of being a, a CDQ group, but uh, take those dollars and, and invest into um, in the Bering Sea additional investments such as individual fishing quotas these are quotas that can be bought and sold on the on the open market and so we we uh, bring those back to western alaska by investing into those and then buying into uh, companies such as what stephanie talked about earlier you know some of those larger pollock companies uh, also invest in cod crab flatfish um, basically anything out in the, the bering sea uh, CDQ, CDQ groups are, are investing in in order to uh, uh, further ingrain ourselves into the, the Bering Sea fisheries and, and provide additional income for uh, future program investments. And so just lastly, one of the, the things that, that we're dealing with and has been, you know, Steve covered well earlier is that, you know, what we're seeing out there right now is a, a large influx of, uh, of northward moving fish. Um, uh, Pacific cod, I think, is, is as Steve highlighted, is, is one of those examples of, you know, a, a few years ago, we didn't, we didn't have these large um, cod stocks up, up north, but all of a sudden, you know, here they are and in, and in huge numbers. And so, um, as, as you can imagine, the, the fishermen are going to go where the, the cod stocks are. And so that's something our communities are 
are, are uh, recognizing and, and uh, dealing with and facing and, and trying to come to terms with the, you know, the, the new normal that is uh, these cod fisheries and other fisheries starting to move north. And so there's going to be, you know, obvious concerns of, of our locals. You know, we get uh, folks from St. Lawrence Island or Diomede Island um, uh, seeing fishing vessels in, you know, in their neck of the woods, it's it's concerning, you know, the, the, the concerns with the impacts with uh, subsistence or, or commercial activities in the in the region um, is is something that that is understandably of, of great concern to our, our residents. But we we also recognize, um, you know, at least at the NSCDC perspective that that uh, a large influx of, of fish, all those cod are up here eating something. And, and there's gonna be downstream effects of, of some nature of those cod um, eating the, the, the sort of thing that, that are typically would be eaten by our, our local resources. And so it's unclear what the, the impacts of that will be. Um, and we're also seeing uh, a, quite the influx of, uh, of marine debris uh, associated with, with fishing uh, as, a, as a result of that as well. Primarily foreign, um, a lot of uh, Russian marked debris washing up, which of course indicates that, that their fleets are, are moving north as well. So, you know, we, we know that there's, there's concerns with uh, um, the, the impacts of this, but there may also be opportunities for development that we need to be thinking about as well as these fisheries move north, you know, in terms of, of fleet support or, or uh, rapid response in, in the case of incidents and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, definitely the sort of thing that's on our mind. But uh, with that, um, thanks again to Commonwealth North for, for inviting me to be here this morning and be open for questions. Great, thank you. Thank you, Simon. And uh, thank you to Steve and Stephanie as well. Um, We'll uh, take questions from uh, from our uh, audience. Um, if uh, I'm getting a lot of good reviews here <laughs> from you for you guys for the information and presentations that you've provided, um, let's start. Uh, Mead, I, I see you've taken your your uh, mute off. Um, do you want to start with any questions? I I guess. Uh... One, I, I've got lots of questions, but I'm going to ask one, Stephanie, and, and uh, actually to all three of you about this uh, military incident. Um, there have been many American, former American crab boats working the Russian side of the Russian fishery. Uh, did Do we have enough communication with the Russian fishery folks to maybe have a joint uh, concern about Russian military exercises. Uh, Stephanie, I agree with everything you have. I was helping somebody write a paper on a Arctic common operating picture uh, there, and we're obviously all pushing for more Coast Guard assets in the Bering Sea. But uh, don't, don't we get along with our neighbors? Do the fishermen know each other? Is this a common problem? Or is this something that the Russians would join you in saying, hey, you can't just come in here and mess things up like this without notice? Uh, that, that's a, a, a very interesting question, Mead. Um, I don't think our fishermen really have a lot of communication. I mean, oftentimes, you know, quite frankly, we're within shouting distance of the Russian Pollock fleet because they're fishing on their side, we're fishing on our side. But, you know, I guess in some respects, we're global competitors. Uh, you know, the Russian Pollock directly competes with the wild Alaska Pollock and uh, so I think, you know, we have a little bit of that stress going on. Um, you know, we do look at their science when they apply for a certification, the Marine Stewardship Council certification. Um, it's hard to interpret. So I guess the quick answer is no, uh, there isn't a lot of cooperation or uh, communication right now um, that I'm aware of. It probably is a, a good goal to move forward with, um, but recognizing you know, Pollock fishermen and Pollock fishermen were competitors. Simon, uh, maybe in your position as council chair, is there enough coordination at all uh, between the council and whoever the Russian 
current uh, regime is in terms of managing fisheries in the same ocean? Uh, thanks, thanks, Mead. Um, boy, there's there's uh, not a, a whole lot of coordination going on there. Um, there there might be some opportunity for that through the uh, uh, International Consultative Committee um, and the Bering Sea Fisheries Ad Advisory Board uh, helps to provide some some input there, but um, that has not occurred at the at the council level. No. Okay, and I and. Uh, uh, just as you get into the Arctic issue, there is there, uh, uh, Steve, is there uh, coordinated science at all uh, from what you were showing us with with the Russian side? Yeah, thank you, Mead. Um, the, the, that's one of the uh, things that I think that we strive for is to try to see if we can start to develop a program to share some of the data. But even in the Bering Sea, when you talk about survey data on the US side and the Russian side, um, there is not a whole lot of data sharing that occurs. And, and um, I think that the same for the Arctic, although for some species such as marine mammals, um, bowhead whales in particular, polar bears, those sorts of data are, uh, are shared, um, but um, we haven't seen that sort of uh, data sharing opportunity or willingness in the uh, fisheries area. Okay. Well, you've just, uh, all three of you have just given me some more ideas on uh, my policy recommendations here, which we'll be getting back to you on, and uh, uh, I don't want to monopolize the airtime here, uh, Juanette, I'm, I'll hand it back to you, but we we have been in touch with the governor of Chukotka, and we're trying to get him to uh, to speak to this group. Uh, it'll probably be a noon meeting because it's four hours earlier over there uh, uh, sometime in November. We're working on it, and then we got a preliminary note today from an associate saying that he's working on a response to us. So. Uh, I want to add it back to you. Sure, thanks, Mead. Um, Steve, I think this question is uh, probably best addressed to you. Uh, you talked about uh, the you know biomass estimates and um, uh, allowable catch in um, the Bering Sea and in the Arctic, and then the sort of redistribution of biomass uh, uh, migrating north. But can maybe you speak to the uh, the the timing of some of these decisions and the research that's available? Uh, we have a question from Lauren Devine talking about, um, you know, how uh, often are newer estimates being made to update the Arctic Fisheries Management Plan, and 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 maybe you could address sort of what are the uh, the uh, pressure points in terms of making some of those critical decisions about possibly opening um, the Arctic fisheries for commercial exploitation. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. And uh, thanks Lauren for the question. Uh, great to hear from you. Um, of course, we are a, a data intensive organization. We rely on the best available data in order to make any sort of management considerations. So if uh, there's a drumbeat that I will continue to beat on, it is surveys, surveys, surveys. Um, if you have the opportunity to contact people and, and um, make it known that the surveys that occur in the Northern Bering Sea um, are extremely important and surveys into the Arctic are going to be increasingly important. So as new survey data become available to the National Marine Fisheries Service, they do update their estimates of biomass for um, all the species in the Arctic, not necessarily just for those that might be of commercial interest. Um, I did show the um, data that were available at the time of the implementation of the FMP so that you could see um, the information that was available to the uh, regulators as they made their decisions. Um, but we do um, keep track of the surveys that do occur in, in the Arctic. We work closely with those scientists at the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in order to just be aware of the, the biomass estimates. And most of the biomass that is in the Arctic, especially in the southern Chukchi, um, is not necessarily of those commercially important species. There's a lot of uh, benthic invertebrates. You know, it's an important feeding area for gray whales, walrus, um, eiders in the wintertime. So um, we do keep track. Um, we would like to see more regular surveys in the Arctic. And if you can, you know, take up that drumbeat, we'd appreciate it as well. 
Well, maybe just a follow on to that is, uh, and maybe you're sort of intimating what the answer might be here, but uh, do you have the resources to do uh, continuous or regular updates to your scientific data? Um, well, the, the council itself is not the funding organization. We are data consumers. And so we rely on the National Marine Fisheries Service to be able to provide those data and that information. So um, Bob Foy, I saw was on the call and he has let us all know that they are trying to do less with less. Um, the, their budget and research budget continues to be cut. Um, so they are struggling to uh, be able to provide the existing surveys. They've done a fantastic job um, so far. COVID gave them additional uh, problems and challenges to overcome. Um, but we would like to see much more um, investment um, in the science. And we'd love to have uh, more data. As we have fewer data, we have more um, uncertainty. And that does require us to be conservative um, in our management approach. So same drumbeat. All right. Juanetta, this is Stephanie, if I might on that. Go ahead. Steph. I think it's important for those that don't live and breathe the council process to understand that the Northern Bering Sea is different than the Arctic FMP area. Mm -hmm. And so we do get, you know, we've been pushing for the Northern Bering Sea surveys, which, which uh, Dr. Foy has been supportive of. I also know that the SSC and Dr. Foy are very interested in uh, trying to get surveys in the Chukchi, not only to assess what's there, but to gain an understanding of what the changing climate is doing. And uh, I think that Dr. Hunt on the SSC always reminds me that the fish aren't going to move north unless the food does. So it's not only looking at where the, the species is, but also tracking uh, wh where their food is uh, traveling as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we, we have a question from uh, uh, General Key, Randy Key. Um, have any of you seen any evidence of the Chinese fishing fleet uh, on the Russian side in the Bering Sea or in the, in the EEZ? Just curious if you're seeing any uh, Chinese activity. Uh, from my fleet, uh, I've not heard anything. Um, it was a learning experience. I guess a reminder that the US EEZ doesn't mean that it's not international water. So, you know, uh, but I have not heard from any of my fleet that they are seeing other, uh, other fleets out there. But I suppose if they're not threatening, uh, they may not think to tell me. So I, I, I'm gonna say no, uh, but I'm not really an expert. And I, I don't have much to add, I'm, I'm in the, same wheelhouse as Stephanie on this one. All right. Okay. And I haven't seen any sort of information about that either. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Simon. Uh, last week, we actually heard a, a session on uh, powering Arctic communities, and we heard from uh, the Northwest Arctic Borough and Kotzebue Electric Association about their efforts to um, introduce uh, alternative energy. And I just wanna highlight something that you pointed out in your presentation about the fuel distribution program because it was a topic that came up last week. Uh, so it's a little bit off point with regard to fisheries, but it's uh, fisheries funded, let's say. Um, right. So Nor uh, Norton Sound has been a real innovator in helping to reduce fuel costs. Um, can you say a little bit more about that program and are any of the other Arctic or Western Alaska communities emulating that program? Thanks, so I, I know there are uh, uh, local organ or regional organizations who, who do that, you know, or some of the school districts have, have done that. Some of the, uh, the other larger um, utility groups have, have done that as, as well, but they're, that's not open to, to all of the participants in our in our communities. So, um, yeah, again, what what we do is we just have a have a, a an open um, application period for for regional entities, you know, uh, smaller communities and and smaller organizations to to say, hey, you know, we we need um, this number of gallons of of fuel this year, and um, they they sign on with us and. Instead of you know ordering a, a smaller amount, the, the aggregated uh, amount is, is quite large. That we uh, then enter into a uh, an agreement with uh, 
a fuel distribution company. And that's where the savings really come in is the transportation of that, that fuel. Um, and, and we are in charge of, we're the single point of contact for the, uh, for the, um, the fuel company to, to move that along. And, and we handle payments to that fuel company and then work with the, the organizations that, uh, that work with us to, uh, to uh, work out the, the finances there. So it's, um, it's, it's beneficial in, in, a, in a couple of ways in that we get the, the bulk fuel discount as well as uh, uh, the, the organizations get a very low interest or, or no interest uh, uh, loan for the, for the fuel. But in, in terms of other um, organizations, there's just a, the few that I, I mentioned there, but I haven't heard of, of it going much further than that. Great. Thanks, Simon. Um, well, uh, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I'm just going to make one last call for any questions in chat. But let me just uh, do a couple of little chores here before we... Um, oh, here comes one. <laughs> um, uh, okay. uh, actually, Chris, I'm going to ask you to unmute and go ahead and ask that question directly, if you don't mind. Um, Chris Barrows. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think I was drawing back to, uh, I think, some of the questions that Mead had, had asked, uh, particularly about data sharing. And um, I know that the panelists know this, but I, I don't know how well maybe the other um, uh, participants on the, on, on the call know that there is a, a formal um, U.S.-Russian intergovernmental committee specifically focused on fisheries. It's called the ICC, which stands for the Interconsultative Committee on Fisheries which is a, um, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, has a U.S. delegation led by the State Department. It includes NOAA and, and National Marine Fisheries officials, including scientists. There's a scientific panel, I think, that's part and parcel to the ICC committee um, and an enforcement panel that the Coast Guard uh, uh, speaks to. So both in the context of uh, coordination on uh, enforcement and military issues, as but but even more, maybe more specifically on the sharing of uh, scientific data. I know that that's been really hard. I mean, my recollection while I while I was on those uh, committees as a Coast Guard member was that uh, we were often trying to share information to solicit a reciprocal sharing of information from the Russians, particularly on the scientific side. Um, so my point is that there's this mechanism that exists. Uh, there's a, this coordination that it does exist. I know that it's been mixed reviews in terms of how well that has served the Alaska fishing industry, um, uh, uh, particularly in the scientific sharing of, of information. And I wonder if the panelists may be able to uh, provide their own views on that. Um, if that mechanism may be a way, and if the U.S. government uh, is is uh, pressing hard enough uh, for an exchange of information in that regard, and uh, alternatively, what other opportunities may exist beyond that that could help supplement um, uh, maybe that process that's been ongoing for for several years now. Thank you, panelists. Um, uh, thank you, Juanetta. Thank you, Chris. Um, I guess you know, there's science is a research science, it's, it's a, that's a big area. And so as you point out, you know, we have the BizFab, which is the Bering Sea Fisher Advisory Committee, that's really primarily focused on uh, the donut hole and bogus loft and Pollock, um, you know, and then we, we go back and forth. I know Dr. Foy's on here probably dying to speak, but, you know, we go back and forth with the Russians. Sometimes they let our research vessels in their waters to complete uh, sometimes we have in the past, but that's kind of broken down a little bit. Um, so I think, you know, we probably need to focus a discussion on, you know, exactly what science do we want to share and how we do that. As Steve mentioned, I think there's probably more back and forth on marine mammals and some of the other species than really fish. And maybe that's because we're, you know, direct competitors with the Russians, specifically on Pollock. Steve or Simon, you want to weigh in on that at all? So I would, um, I guess, responding to whether or not that's a good uh, platform. It's certainly an existing platform, and I think an existing platform is probably going to be better than trying to create, recreate a platform. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's going to be increasingly important, especially as uh, the open water uh, in the Arctic um, becomes greater and greater and more interest develops. Um, 
you know, Ambassador Bolt did talk about the international waters and the fact that there is a moratorium there that um, for at least 16 years. Um, but that is going to affect how the U.S. thinks about our domestic uh, EEZ and how fisheries can occur there, especially as we think about um, exploratory fisheries. So it's going to be increasingly important. I'd like to see um, those sorts of data being shared. Um, but again, there are there are challenges around it. Simon, any thoughts? Uh, nothing that isn't duplicative. I think I think Chris Chris said it well. I mean, there is that, and and Steve, it, that platform is there. Um, that it's it's set up, and and this would be a, a great place to be able to exchange that sort of information. But it's uh, with my experiences, it's been um, frustrating trying to to get that reciprocity uh, in exchanges with, with Russia at this point. But, you know, th there may be opportunities in the future there. And I think that ICC is probably the right place to do it. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And thanks to the panel. I know we've got a little bit over time, but we do have another uh, point that I want to uh, draw out. Uh, uh, General Key, uh, Church Key is uh, online with us. And um, of course, he's with the Arctic Domain Awareness Center, one of our collaborators on this Arctic series and um, recent presidential appointee to the U.S. Arctic Commission. And uh, uh, Church, you have something that you'd like to address the panel? Yes, thank you very much. And thanks again. Congratulations to all the panelists for some outstanding presentations today. Um, I have the privilege of serving at the Arctic, uh, the, uh, Arctic Domain Awareness Center, which is a science technology research effort that is hosted by the University of Alaska. Um, and we are in the process of starting a, uh, in the final, getting the final okay to proceed in developing uh, and starting a, uh, an Alaskan and Arctic maritime communications and connectivity assessment. Uh, and this is something we would be doing in support of the, of the Coast Guard's mission for the public good. And what we'd like to know if there's any interest with uh, you as panelists, uh, or if there's anyone else that's interested, that's on this call, that's interested in being part of essentially what we're trying to do is get a, a snap the chalk line of the challenges in both communications and connectivity for mariners that are operating in uh, Alaskan waters uh, in being able to uh, do ship to shore or ship to ship or being able to have any, any level of connectivity challenge, trying to get a good snap of the chalk line for this assessment in order to then help the Coast Guard and, D and Department of Homeland Security uh, sponsor uh, onward research that tries to address the gaps and seams and, and really shortfalls uh, in uh, Mariner communication connectivity assessment. And, uh, and so I'd be interested if there's folks uh, that, um, uh, that people have the ability to, I'd be happy to reach out to you individually or as a group. And so I will give my email address to Winetta uh, and you can happily respond to if you'd like to. My bottom line is an opportunity. There is some funding opportunities for people's participation in this. It's not large money because it's research, but there is some money for people's time uh, to be a part of this. And I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested in being a part of this. Last point I mentioned is I look forward to, along with Stephanie joining that uh, rescheduled uh, uh, Senate uh, testimony. I was uh, planning to be uh, one of the folks in the same panel as Stephanie for that presentation on the 22nd of September. And uh, I look forward to the chance to get another shot at that. So Stephanie, I echo a lot of the concerns you mentioned today. And I certainly believe that uh, some new policies need to come as a result of this, again, for uh, situational awareness and also being able to protect uh, U.S. fishermen operating within our EEZ. Thanks so much, Winetta, for this chance to visit. Right. Thank you, Church. Um, I have posted uh, Church's email in the chat. Um, so again, I encourage everybody to follow up with him on that. I do apologize for going over time. We try to stick to an hour, but this is a rich topic and a great interest in what our panelists had to say. Uh, I want to just point uh, out that uh, next week we will have a work session on the 28th um, that'll be focused on the report outline and findings. On November 4th, we have a session uh, on communications in the Arctic that'll be uh, moderated by Alex Hills, um, who is a real pioneer in communications in Alaska. And we have a number of panelists. That session will be scheduled to go 90 minutes um, because we will have four or five panelists. Uh, we did hear from uh, the governor of Chukotka and uh, hope to have a session with him on November 25th. 
Uh, we're tentatively slating uh, December 2nd for a session on Arctic tourism and uh, may have one final session on December 9th with other um, international um, participants in the Arctic. So uh, keep your eye on your email for those notices on upcoming sessions. And let me just turn it back to Mead for any closing comments. Mead? Yeah, thank you, uh, Juanetta. And uh, um, you, you turned off my video, but uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, let me just say uh, to, to, uh, uh, to everybody here, thanks for a great presentation, uh, sets of presentations. Uh, one of the recommendations that uh, has been made to us, Paul Foos made it early, is that we try to create in the Bering Sea something very much like the Barents Sea consultation process that uh, uh, the Scandinavian countries have with Russia. Uh, and it's kind of a regional annual review of the bidding on, on everything, energy cooperation, uh, transportation, tourism, fishing, not to supplant what you've got there, but to essentially to have at one point where senior people uh, in both countries kind of uh, uh, review the bidding and help get things back on track. And it's pretty clear to me from listening to this presentation just on the absence of the science, uh, absence of the, uh, uh, you know, the common operating picture that ended up with the military issues uh, and, and so forth that we need better communication across the Bering Straits. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we put in a marine transportation issue early, but we didn't get, uh, you know, but it, it, it didn't help here, uh, Stephanie, it should have. And uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to revamp this right now. Uh, at any rate, uh, thank you all very much. And uh, uh, we'll stand adjourned next, uh, on, the, on the 28th, we will have a, a, a session uh, with, with Cal Stevenson and others, an open discussion session on policy issues. And we'll try to get an outline uh, uh, out to, uh, members of our mailing list. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Commonwealth North. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll be posting a recording of the session and uh, the slide decks on uh, the Arctic Policy uh, Study Group webpage. So please look for that there.